the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Well, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome you to this very special Ask With Forum with Arnie Duncan, United States uh, Secretary of Education. I know many of you, but not all of you. I'm Kathleen McCartney, Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, this year, Harvard is celebrating its 375th anniversary, and um, this forum is a part of our celebration of the lively intellectual exchanges that have flourished at Harvard for 375 years. Uh, I welcome all of you, but I want to give a special welcome to some uh, educators who are in the room with us today, right in the front row, I think mostly, but Paul Revel is here, the Massachusetts Secretary of Education. Mitchell Chester is here the Massachusetts Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, Jeff Young is here, Superintendent of Cambridge Public Schools, and Paul Toner, the President of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. So thanks to all of you, as well as our special guests, um, for being here. Um, as we all know, we are at a great moment of opportunity with respect to public education. Uh, the national attention on education has never been greater. In a recent op-ed, Secretary Duncan wrote about the immense responsibility of our field because, and I quote, children only get one chance at an education. Um, the children of this country are lucky to have Secretary Duncan in this important role. His accomplishments at the Department of Education have been lauded by Democrats and Republicans alike. As we all know, he created the Race to the Top program, a program that awarded more than $4 billion to states. He's investing in education innovation through his I3 program, and we're very proud that our own Jimmy Kim was a recipient last year for his Project Reads program. He convened the governors to work together to establish common core standards, which have been adopted by 45 states and the District of Columbia. And he and the president are overhauling the student loan industry. Um, I want to mention one other aspect of his work that's making me particularly proud, and that is his unrelenting commitment to children as evidenced by his efforts to reduce bullying in schools. Uh, under the Secretary's leadership, the Department of Education has convened two bullying prevention summits and helped launch states to uh, implement anti-bullying legislation. One of the reasons I think Secretary Duncan is being so effective and leading so boldly is that his work is grounded in practice. As many of us know, he was the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools from 2001 to 2008, where he worked tirelessly on behalf of the city's children. He knows how hard the work is, but he also knows, as we do, that education is not an intractable problem. And I've been thinking about where Secretary Duncan learned his leadership skills, and I've decided, of course, it was here at Harvard, <laughs> where he was co-captain of the Harvard men's basketball team. So again, as many of you know, uh, Secretary Duncan is an accomplished basketball player who's been known to win a few one-on-one -on -one games against President Obama. Um, Arnie, I thought you'd like to know that Harvard trounced BC last December. I was there, and let's hope they make it to the NCAA tournament this year. But we're not here to talk about basketball, or God forbid, football. <laughs> <laughs> we're here to talk about education. The provocative title of Arnie's talk is Fighting the Wrong Education Battles. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Arnie Duncan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean McCarthy, for that kind introduction, all of your leadership. Please give her a round of applause. I think she's doing an amazing job here. Two quick apologies before I get serious. Uh, first of all, to those Patriots fans, I'm very, very sorry. I feel your pain. As I told Matt earlier, my son turned eight uh, on the second, four days ago. And we actually got him a Tom Brady jersey, which I think he's worn for four days straight. And he was a heartbroken young man last night. So it's a tough night in the Duncan household. And then some of you may have come here thinking you want to hear from Lady Gaga. I apologize. <laughs> I can't sing, I have no talent. Um, she is coming later this month, and uh, hopefully you can get a ticket to her uh, sold out show. Uh, I think I'm just the warm up act here today. Um, in all seriousness, as Dean McCarthy talked about, I'm just actually really, really pleased that Lady Gaga 
has been working so hard to reduce the problem of bullying in our schools, especially among LBGT youth. And she's, been a true, she's shown true passion and commitment to protecting children and to reducing violence and abuse. And I absolutely applaud her passion and her commitment. Um, but I don't want to speak today about Lady Gaga's advocacy, but about well-attentioned advocacy that I think goes awry. I want to talk about advocacy that inadvertently becomes less about helping children and making tough choices and becomes more about maintaining ideological purity and making what I consider false choices. The dysfunctional gridlock in Congress today is no secret. Reauthorization of ESEA or the No Child Left Behind Act has been stalled for years, even though, even though no one thinks the law is acceptable as it is. We all know NCLB is fundamentally broken. But I'm not just talking about the politics of paralysis in Washington. In schools of education, in the blogosphere, in school board meetings, in superintendent's offices, in union halls, and in think tanks, too many educators, researchers, parents, and advocates are fighting the wrong battles. The wrong education battles tend to follow a well-defined pattern. And you can actually almost close your eyes and still know exactly how things will unfold as everyone usually plays according to type. Well-intentioned advocates on both sides present policy choices as an either-or choice, not as a both-and compromise, however imperfect, that needs to be ironed out. So being for more state flexibility somehow means you're against accountability. Supporting the use of student achievement data in English and math as one element in assessing school performance means you must oppose teaching a well-rounded curriculum. Being in favor of high-quality career and technical education somehow means you must oppose giving those same students a high-quality college prep education. In the wrong education battles, collaboration gets dismissed as weakness, not as a way to work out a win-win for children. In the wrong education battles, the perfect all too often becomes the enemy of the good. And the dysfunctional status quo persists, hurting children, hurting teachers, and ultimately hurting our country's economic competitiveness as we continue to undereducate far too many of our nation's youth. And today, I want to talk about two challenges that all too often end up as the wrong education battles. The first is the debate over the impact of in-school influences, like teachers and principals, on student achievement versus the impact of out-of-school influences, like poverty and poor health. The second related battle is over reforming teacher evaluation systems and the use or the misuse of student achievement data in teacher evaluation. And before diving into those debates, I want to make a couple of quick points. First, I'm not in any way opposed to vigorous debate. In fact, I always try to welcome it. I recognize that these are issues that stir strong, strong passions and opposing viewpoints. And there's a good reason why these controversies are often refer referred to as the education wars. And I want to hear from teachers and principals and lawmakers and union heads who disagree with me. That's a democratic process at work, and I actually treasure it. The best way to sharpen your understanding of complex issues is to have your own ideas challenged. And I'm so grateful to Harvard professor Monica Higgins, who's here, for bringing many of the smartest minds and most accomplished practitioners to, to meet with me and my management team with, for a wide-ranging series of listening and learning sessions. And there's a lot of spirited debate that goes into those discussions. And now, while I welcome that debate, I don't find that, that, that debate, when it becomes detached from real-world challenges or is driven primarily by I ideology, I don't think that advances the best interests of children. And unfortunately, those distorted debates happen all too often in the field of education. In 2012, our nation has urgent, urgent education problems. In a globally competitive, knowledge-based economy, it's a stain on our nation that today one in four American students fail to finish high school on time or drop out. In many of our black and Latino communities, 40 to 50 percent of students are dropping out. That is absolutely morally unacceptable and it's economically unsustainable. In just a single generation, the U.S. has gone from having the highest college attainment rates in the world among young adults to 16th, from first to 16th. And in international comparisons, our performance is mediocre at best. And it's fascinating, the only thing our students lead the world in is their sense of self-esteem. Think about that for a moment. The hard truth is that many nations are outperforming 
and out educating us. It is this compared to what litmus test that educators, school leaders, and parents must constantly keep in mind. Someone once complained to Voltaire that life is hard, and to which he replied, compared to what? Educational failure is hard too, but the first question we should ask of reforms is, would these changes significantly, even dramatically, enrich and accelerate learning for students and for teachers? We shouldn't be asking, is this the perfect solution? We should be asking, is this a much better solution? Can it help us challenge the status quo and accelerate student achievement? For me, this sense of urgency about dramatically improving our education system comes from personal experience. It's deeply ingrained in me. From the time we were born, my brother, my sister, and myself all went to my mother's after-school program every day on the south side of Chicago, which she began 50 years ago in 1961. When we were little, the older students tutored the younger ones. As we grew up, it was our job to tutor the younger students. My mom always tried to have students both teach and be taught at the same time. And when we were done with our studies and our chores, we played basketball in the evenings. Everyone knew her program was a safe haven where kids were nurtured, they were respected, they were challenged, and they were taught right from wrong. The students and my peers in my mother's program happened to live in a poor community that was plagued by violence and many face severe challenges at home. Yet, because of the opportunities that my mother and others created for them, we saw some remarkable success stories bloom from that corner of 46 and Greenwood. The teenager who tutored my group when we were growing up, named Carrie Holly, today is an IBM engineer who was recently named one of the 50 most important black research scientists in the country. He was raised by his grandmother and never met his father. Corky Lyons, who was one of nine children, became a surgeon. Michael Clark Duncan pursued his dreams in Hollywood, where he starred in The Green Mile. And Ron, and Ron Raglan eventually helped me manage the Chicago Public Schools. Building upon the experience that had helped to shape him, Ron brought the AVID program to Chicago to strengthen the vital non-cognitive skills of disadvantaged students. I know, I think we all here know what's possible when we give young people long-term guidance, educational opportunities, and the commitment and connection to a caring adult. I know our students can be successful regardless of their background, regardless of their zip code, regardless of their socioeconomic status. What drives me every day is the recognition that we have this huge untapped academic and social potential that our nation is, for some reason, leaving on the table. I am absolutely convinced that education is the civil rights issue of our generation. When I became CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, I tried to take that lifetime of lessons to scale. Everyone who has worked with poor children know that poverty matters and affects school performance. But everyone who has witnessed the life-altering impact of great teachers and great principals know that schools matter tremendously as well. Boosting student achievement is not an either-or solution. Educators in a broader community should be attacking both in-school and out-of-school causes of low academic achievement. And I'm a big believer in high-quality out-of-school programming including full-service community schools. In Chicago, under my leadership, it became, the city became a national leader in large-scale adoption of community schools. By the time I left Chicago, it had more than 150 community schools, the most in the nation. In many of these schools, almost three dozen had full-service health clinics attached to them. And it never made sense to me that poor children should be expected to learn just as readily as other students when they couldn't see the blackboard, or when their mouths ached from untreated cavities or gum disease. So we dramatically expanded our free vision and dental programs in our schools. Six years ago, about 12,500 students in the Chicago Public Schools received free vision services, and roughly 10,000 students got prescription eyeglasses. Three years later, the number of students receiving free vision and services and eyeglasses had both more than doubled. The dental care program grew even more dramatically, going from treating 1,250 students to more than 50,000 students. Obviously, the need didn't increase at that rate. We were simply beginning, beginning to address the need that was already there. Since taking office, the Obama administration has also rapidly expanded funding for out-of-school supports for students. Starting with the, with the Recovery Act, 
the administration invested $5 billion in growing Head Start, an early Head Start, that expanded access to quality child care for over 150,000 new children. This December, we invested another $500 million through an unprecedented early learning race to the top competition. For the first time, states are designing comprehensive plans, not just to increase access to high quality early learning, but to better coordinate the patchwork of programs that now exists in virtually every state. And I congratulate Massachusetts, who was one of nine states to win a Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge grant. This is great, great leadership here. And don't forget President Obama's health care legislation. You may not know that under the new law, the administration has provided more than 275 school-based health care clinics with about $100 million to provide more health care services at schools around the country. These grants will enable school-based health clinics to serve an additional 440,000 young people, a jump of over 50%. In short, from day one, we have tried to pursue a cradle-to-career education agenda and is very much epitomized by our Promised Neighborhoods grants, which support a program of high-quality wraparound services in strong neighborhood schools modeled after the Harlem Children's Zone. And I want to underline that great schools and great teachers are the most effective anti-poverty tool of all. And that's why a good school has to be at the heart of every Promise Neighborhoods initiative. Even back in Chicago, people used to tell me that we could never fix our schools until we ended poverty. And as I say, I'm a huge fan of out-of-school anti-poverty programs. I was actually raised in one. But I absolutely reject the idea that poverty is somehow destiny. Despite challenges at home, Despite neighborhood violence, despite poverty, despite tough families, I know that every single child can learn and can thrive. And it's the responsibility of schools to teach all children and have high expectations for every child, rich or poor. Jeff Canada, the founder and visionary leader of, leader of the Harlem Children's Zone, is one of my heroes. He discovered firsthand that even a continuum of high quality wraparound services isn't enough is not enough to dramatically boost student achievement. You have to have a great school to close what we call the opportunity gap. HCZ's parenting classes, their first-rate preschool program, and the supplemental services inside Harlem schools, the tutors, the computer labs, the after-school enrichment, collectively, they weren't doing nearly enough to boost student achievement. So Jeff Canada decided he had to create an outstanding school. Then he did something else. He commissioned a rigorous study of the Harlem Children's Zone by Harvard's own Roland Fryer, the brilliant young economist. Fryer's research showed that while support services helped increase student achievement for children in the neighborhood, it was actually Canada's school, Promise Academy, which dramatically boosted student learning and helped to close achievement gaps. Professor Fryer didn't stop there. He asked, what are the characteristics of high-performing charter schools? And can they be applied to, to, to traditional public schools? Together, we must stop being satisfied with pockets of excellence and start taking to scale what is working. Roland's question wasn't an ivory tower academic exercise. Instead, he reached out to Terry Greer, super, uh, the superintendent of schools in Houston, and said, let's try adopting those practices of high-performing charter schools in Houston's lowest-performing public schools and see if we can have an impact. The preliminary results of the Houston experiment, which affects more than 7,000 students in nine schools, are now coming in, and those early results are very, very encouraging. After just a year of implementation, student achievement in math is up dramatically, and reading scores are increasing. Enrollment in four-year colleges is up by about 40 percent. Even more encouraging, Roland, Flyer, Roland Fryer's Houston experiment is just part of a body of exciting new research on a new generation of gap-closing schools. Rigorous research that uses random assignment comparisons is documenting that high-poverty schools can dramatically narrow achievement and attainment gaps. The Boston Foundation has documented the big impact on student learning of great schools right here in Boston. Mathematica has documented the large gap-narrowing impact of 22 KIPP middle schools from around the nation. Harvard's Tom Kane, and Tom's here as well, has documented the benefits of KIPP's LIN for English language learners and special needs students. 
Other researchers have found that the new generation of small high schools in New York City are boosting student learning and narrowing those insidious achievement gaps. Now, if a curious visitor from another country plunked down in the midst of our education debates, he would likely find this new generation of gap-closing schools to be very, very exciting news. He would find them a wonderful testament to the power of outstanding teachers and great principals and strong community partners to transform the life chances of children. But, in fact, the response of some in the U.S. education establishment to schools that produce dramatic gains in student learning has been much more critical, even dismissive. That curious visitor would be puzzled by those who respond to, no, to successful no-excuses schools by making excuses for why they somehow don't really matter. Of course, no one, no one should object to understanding both the limitations and the strengths of this new research on gap-closing schools. But the skeptics of successful schools have jumped from one critique to another, none of which have found much confirmation in rigorous research. It's so telling to me that advocates wedded to the idea that school achievement is simply a reflection of poverty seem determined to diminish the value of great teachers and great principals and great schools. In my mind, that disrespects the hard work, the talent, and the tremendous commitment of teachers and principals at these schools who have literally dedicated their lives to working with disadvantaged children because they know they can make that special connection that changes young people's lives. And you don't have to look any further than Massachusetts, it's, it's your own educational system, to see that both in-school and out-of-school challenges can be tackled and should be tackled at the same time. Over the years, Massachusetts has deeply invested in school reform. It has created rigorous assessments. It created college and career-ready academic standards instead of dumbing down standards as so many other states did. Academic achievement and attainment have gone up substantially. And in many respects, Massachusetts is the highest performing state in the nation. But Massachusetts also addressed out-of-school factors that impede student learning. Under the courageous leadership of Governor Deval Patrick, it has invested in creating the largest extended learning time experiment in the country. It is one of the best coordinated early learning systems in the nation. And that's why we invested in part through Race to the Top. In 2010, the Massachusetts legislature passed a law that calls for chronically underperforming schools to have a significant health and social service component to their school's turnaround plans. To better integrate social service supports, the state established a child and youth readiness cabinet co-chaired by the Secretary of Health and Human Services and Secretary of Education, Paul Revel. The both and solution can and must be done, and they are being done right here in Massachusetts. And instead of resting on its laurels, the state is helping lead the country where we need to go. Now, the second false choice that I want to talk about today is a debate over whether teacher evaluation should include measures of student achievement and growth. Again, I reject the idea that this should be an either-or debate. Critics of standardized testing make a lot of very valid points. It is absolutely true that many of today's tests are flawed. They don't measure critical thinking skills across a range of content areas. They're not always aligned to college and career-ready standards. They don't always accurately measure individual student growth. And they certainly don't measure qualities of great teaching that we know make a difference. Things like classroom management, teamwork, collaboration, and individualized instruction. They don't measure the invaluable ability to inspire a love of learning. And as I have said over and over again, teacher evaluation should never, never be based only on test scores. It should always include multiple measures like principal observation, peer review, student work, student surveys, and parental feedback. And that's one reason we're putting real resources into moving beyond filling the bubble tests. Our $350 million Race to the Top Assessment Competition is funding two large state consortia covering 44 states in D.C. to develop new and much, a new and much improved generation of assessments. Once again, Massachusetts, thanks to Mitchell Chester's leadership, is helping to drive one of those efforts. And going forward, for the first time, Teachers will consistently have timely, high-quality, formative assessments that are instructionally useful and document real student growth. And for the first time, the new assessments will better measure higher-order thinking skills so vital to success in the global economy. 
Still, the shortcomings of today's tests don't mean we should simply abandon the use of standardized testing in schools and in teacher evaluation. In the last decade, I have talked to literally thousands of teachers and school leaders. Now, I've yet to speak to one who thinks that teacher evaluation in America works well today. Let me be clear. Teacher evaluation today is largely broken and dysfunctional. It has been useless for decades. No one can say who the great teachers are, how the teachers in the middle can improve, or which teachers should be dismissed if they fail to improve even after receiving help. And I often use the story of California. California has 300,000 teachers in its state. The top 10%, the top 30,000, I would argue would be some of the best teachers in the world, literally world class. The bottom 30,000, the bottom 10% probably shouldn't be teaching. They should be doing something else. But no one in California, no one can tell you who those top 30,000 are and who that bottom 30,000 are. Something is radically wrong with that picture. And again, we always have to ask that compared to what question? Is an evaluation system that uses at least some measure of student achievement and growth, even if imperfect, preferable to an evaluation system that takes no, no account of student learning? I learned a lot in Washington, but I was literally stunned, absolutely stunned, when I discovered that we had states that had laws on the books that prohibited using student achievement in teacher evaluation. Think about how crazy that looks and what a perverse message that sends to the entire teaching profession. Thanks in part to the race at top, all those laws that were on some states' books, all those laws are now gone. And while the use of value-added analysis to measure student growth is still very much a work in progress. With all these imperfections, I still think it's a big improvement over a system that takes no account of student growth in the classroom. Thanks to groundbreaking research by Raj Chetty and John Friedman here at Harvard and their colleague at Columbia, Jonah Rockoff, we now know that the long-term impact of good teachers on students into their, adult, into their adulthood is profound. Their study was not about good teachers creating short-term bumps in test scores. It demonstrated teachers, for better or for worse, literally altered the trajectory of their students' lives. Their analysis over about a two-decade time on the long-term impact that teachers had on 2.5 million children found that simply by replacing one teacher in the bottom 5% for advancing student growth with an average teacher, not even with a great one, but with an average teacher, would increase the student's lifetime income in that classroom by more than $250,000. And improvements in teacher quality also significantly reduce the chances of those young people having a child while a teenager and also increase college matriculation. If you want to increase earning potential, decrease poverty, and reduce teenage pregnancy, then I think we should spend a lot of time, a lot of time, thinking about how to attract and retain and reward great teachers and principals particularly in disadvantaged communities. We're still learning about how to improve teacher evaluation and incorporate measures of student growth. But the work of Tom Kane here at Harvard and the MET project, which is based on classroom observations of 3,000 teachers, is the largest study of instructional practice and its relationship to student outcomes ever undertaken. As a result, we now know much more today how to do teacher evaluation right than ever before. Now, some folks will, will point out correctly that most teachers don't teach in tested subjects. So how can student achievement be factored into teacher evaluation in those non-tested subjects? It's a great question, but I have every faith that teachers themselves can come up with solutions. In fact, they already are. Just last week, I met with Drew Davidson, a fantastic music teacher from Memphis, Tennessee. Arts teachers there in Memphis were frustrated because they were being evaluated solely based upon school-wide performance in English and math. He didn't think that was fair, and he was right. So he convened a, groups of, a group of arts educators to come up with a better, more thoughtful evaluation system. After Drew's committee surveyed arts educators across the city of Memphis, they decided to develop a blind peer review evaluation to assess portfolios of student learning. It has proved to be enormously popular, so much so that Tennessee is now looking to adopt that system statewide for arts instructors. If we're willing to listen and if we're willing to do things differently, those answers are out there. I can't finish this discussion without recognizing the extraordinary contribution of Paul Toner, the president of the Massachusetts Teacher Association. 
Paul courageously led his union to include three-year trends in student growth as one measure in teacher evaluation and tested subjects. And that's just the kind of informed, carefully tailored, and localized collaboration that school districts desperately need. The truth is, we need more labor and management leaders who are willing to engage in tough-minded collaboration and step outside of their comfort zones. And I want to applaud those who do, like Dennis Van Roykel, the president of the NEA, and Wendy Kopp, the founder of Teach for America. They are challenging the status quo together. They recently co-authored an op-ed calling for major improvements to teacher preparation programs, which in many places desperately, desperately need to be overhauled. And even though they are maybe at odds on a number of issues historically, they're still seeking common ground instead of just shooting at each other from their separate silos. In some quarters, this simple display of mutual respect and collaboration was, meted with, was met with suspicion and with disapproval. Some folks seem to prefer the Hatfield and McCoy feuds, which go, on for, which go on forever and which accomplish nothing productive. In my experience, tough-minded collaboration in education is typically much, much more successful than tough-minded confrontation. And Massachusetts, once again, has helped to set the example under the leadership of Paul Revel, Mitchell Chester, and Paul Toner. I'd like those three gentlemen to please stand, and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> this work is tough, very tough, and they have a long way to go. But I'm absolutely convinced that their thoughtfulness, their courage is going to help to lead not just the state, but the country where we need to go. I love the fact that none of these men are passive or complacent. They know that here in Massachusetts, for all the amazing triumphs, for all the success stories, for all the leadership, they know this state has a long, long way to go to help every child be successful and to close those achievement gaps. Collaborating with people who you disagree with doesn't mean you have to give up on transformation reform. You just have to give up on the idea of getting everything you want under the terms that you want. In Chicago and in Washington, I can't tell you how many times I've been told, don't aim too high, or you're going too fast, or it will never happen. But I think the skeptics vastly underestimate the commitment to change in the classroom and the capacity and the, and the desire of teachers and principals to advance student learning. When the Obama administration took office, the president and I started talking about the need for states to stop dummying down academic standards. We had to set a higher bar for success. Creating common, higher standards, college and career ready standards, internationally benchmarked, was supposed to be the third rail of education politics. It was never going to happen, and no one, none of, the, none, of the, none of the skeptics, none of the pundits, none of the experts, no one predicted what rapidly unfolded. Thanks to courageous leadership, not from any of us in Washington, but at the state level, and with our encouragement, 45 states in D.C., in a state-led effort, have now adopted Common Core standards. That's an absolute game changer for schools, for teachers, and most importantly, for our children. For the first time, for the first time in our nation's history, a child right here in Massachusetts and a child in Mississippi will be measured by the same yardstick. I've also talked repeatedly about the need to transform the way schools and districts turn around chronically underperforming schools. I've said turnaround efforts have for far too long been timid and that we had to stop tinkering around the edges in schools that were cheating generations of children out of their one chance to get a high quality education. Again, I was told, don't aim too high. It's impossible to turn around struggling schools at scale. We're now starting to get the preliminary results from the first year of our school improvement grants program, working with about 1,000 schools around the nation. And nothing's final yet. And we obviously have a number of years to go before we can really judge the success or the failure of this effort. The hard work is absolutely just beginning. But after just one year, I'm pleased to say that the impact on student achievement is much more encouraging than the experts expected. Many schools, like Orchard Gardens, right here in the Orchard Park projects in Roxbury, are showing double-digit gains in reading and math proficiency in their first year. Change is possible if you're willing to do things differently. So in closing, I'd like to encourage advocates to stop fighting the wrong education battles. Seek common ground, knowing that it will take you both outside of your comfort zone and require tough-minded collaboration. The educational fa challenges facing our nation are both massive and urgent. But I'm convinced that the capacity 
the courage, and the commitment of our nation's teachers, school leaders, parents, and students themselves are absolutely up to the challenge. Let's stop defending the status quo when it hurts children. Let's wage the right education battles. And together, let's work collectively to advance achievement and a love of learning for all of our nation's children. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take your questions. We have a couple of microphones here, far away. Uh, Maybe go to the mic so people, folks can hear you. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the things you know, I had a uh, whole question when you were just talking about a few minutes ago was uh, advanced education for teachers and the redrawing of curriculums and the schools that are producing teachers, which I think are, uh, from my perspective, are highly flawed given what we're trying to face. And So I think this School of Education is doing so many things right. And again, I just thank Dean McCarthy for her leadership and the faculty here. But I've been pretty tough, quite frankly, on schools of education around the country in general. And I've been tough because when you survey teachers from around the nation, 62% of young teachers say they were ill-prepared to enter the classroom. And I always say if 62% of doctors were unprepared to practice medicine, we would have a revolution in this country. But the fact that as teachers, somehow that's OK. The two basic complaints that young teachers have one, not enough hands-on classroom experience managing real students. Lots of theory of education, history of education, philosophy of education, not enough hands-on work with young people. Secondly, in the past five or 10 years, there's been this flourishing of technology. So formative assessments, real-time feedback, not about what I'm teaching, but what my students are actually learning. Far too many professors in schools of education have been out of the classroom for 15, 20, 30 years, have missed this. So good young teachers are learning this on the job. It's helping them take their craft to a different level. But they're wondering, why do I have to learn it so late? Why aren't I learning it when I'm in a school of education? So we have a lot of hard work to do there. Schools of ed have to stop being just cash cows for universities. They have to have a higher bar to entry. They have to have much more practical uh, training going in. I'm a big believer in the, the medical model, the residency model, of, you know, having teachers practice with, with master teachers. And right now, unfortunately, in many places in the country, schools of ed are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Well, again, I go back to what are you teaching? It's got to be hands-on work in the classroom, much greater focus on technology, cultural competency, teaching children different from, from your own background. Hi, I'm a master's student here in the Ed Policy and Management Program, and I'm also a former Chicago Public Schools teacher. So uh, I just wanted to ask you first, do you think the Bulls are going to win the NBA championship <laughs> this year? A absolutely. Good. <laughs> Me too. Um, the other question I have is, so I was just curious what lessons you took out of Renaissance 2010 in Chicago and how, for good or for, you know, for better or for worse, they've kind of informed your work at a national level um, and what lessons you took away. Sure. So for those that don't know, what we tried to do is where we had very low performing schools, we tried to really challenge the status quo and do some things uh, very different. And we, learned, we did some things right, we did some things wrong, we learned a lot of things. Um, one thing we did poorly at first and we adjusted is we initially closed the school and moved children to other schools and we had lots of gang violence in the communities. The other schools may have been slightly better but not a lot better and you're putting kids from lots of different backgrounds into these new schools. So we had some real challenges there. What we did over time is to change the adults in the building but keep the children right there. And it was less disruptive to the other schools. The transition was, was uh, not as tough. I'll give you one example. We had a school that was one of the three, we had 600 schools in Chicago, one of the three worst in the city uh, in terms of performance. Made a bunch of changes, different leadership, different teachers, different, you know, a whole different set of expectations. Same children, same building, same socioeconomic challenges, same violence in the neighborhood. And we went from being one of the three worst schools in Chicago to being the fastest improving elementary school in the entire state. And so again, great adults make a huge difference. I think what we have not done at scale, which we're trying to do, is to figure out how do we attract and retain great, great talent to go into these communities. Far too often that talent flees. And how do we get the hardest working, the most committed, to see this as a badge of honor to go in and do this work? And then how do we think about the wraparound services, the after school program, the additional counselors, the social workers, to give students a chance to fulfill their potential? The district that I think has probably done this better than, than most, maybe the best in the country, is Charlotte Mecklenburg 
where they are systemically identifying their best teachers, their best principals, and then putting them in mass in their low performing schools. When I went out there and talked to a bunch of folks, I talked to one of the principals who had been an absolute superstar. Um, he was going to retire. And they talked him out of retirement to go to one of these very low performing schools. He said, Arnie, this is, you know, I'm so thankful I had the opportunity. This was the most moral and ethical work I've ever done in my career. And to me, that was a really profound statement. So he could have walked off, you know, just gone into retirement, had had a fantastic career, but he felt so thankful for the opportunity to go in. That's the kind of culture I think we have to create around the country. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tara Cruz. I'm in the Higher Education Master's Program here. Last month, uh, your department released a call to action for civic engagement and learning in which it cited the potential for civic engagement and learning to close the achievement gap at the higher education level. Can you talk a little bit about what the department can do to offer incentives for higher education administrators and faculty to support this kind of work. Yeah, and it's not just at the higher education level. For me, it goes down to high school and elementary right. and middle school. But my, my short anecdote, I think if you survey most Americans, most know the Three Stooges. More folks know the Three Stooges than the three branches of government. So you wonder why we're struggling. That's probably, that sort of epitomizes the challenge there. So what can we do? We can, uh, we can share best practices. We can use the bully pul pulpit. We can take to scale what is working. I'm a big believer in sort of service projects and service learning, getting students engaged in the community. Young people are crying out for these kinds of opportunities. I think, again, sometimes there's a disconnect from what young people want and what universities are providing them. When you survey students going into college, there's this huge interest in being engaged civically and learning more. But when they leave, some, some folks feel they really didn't get what, you know, what they wanted out of that four-year college experience. So we have a team of folks that Martha Cantor is leading this effort, extraordinarily committed here. I think it's great for our country, I think it's great for our democracy, but I also think it will engage students much more deeply in their own education, it'll make it much more relevant, it will keep them going to school, again, not just in the higher ed side, but in high school and in middle and elementary school as well. So I think we're onto something important, we can bully pulpit it, we can share what's working, and then when we see places who are like not engaging at all, I think we can call them out as well. Hello, my name is Laura McNeil. I'm a faculty fellow in the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, founded by Professor Charles Ogletree. And in your speech, you mentioned the cradle to career uh, pipeline, which I think is a great initiative and notion. Um, but my question is related to the cradle to prison pipeline. Specifically, as I'm sure you know, um, existing school disciplinary policies have a disparate impact on African American youth. And so I'm wondering, are there any new initiatives on the horizon to address this disparity? So it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, and these are all great questions. There's no easy answers there. It's one of the things I worry about most, and uh, you always hear about some states that are predicting you know, prison cells down the road based upon third grade reading achievement. And so looking at what we're doing in terms of those discipline policies, I would go one step further. What are we doing in terms of labeling students for special ed? It's disproportionately black and brown boys, you know, young men of color. Um, you see a, a state like Texas that put out some staggering number, like half their children of color have been expelled. And again, we need to keep children in school, not put them out to the streets. But let me sort of take this as on, on a personal level. Um, in Chicago, I got very, very worried about the number of young people who were being arrested. And I was worried that, about this sort of school to, uh, to prison pipeline. So I met with the head of the police and said, we got a real problem here in the city. What can we do together? He was new, and how do we think this thing through? Um, he said, do some research and come, come back to me. And he came back and uh, said, guess what? I said, you know, okay, what are we going to do? What are your ideas? He said, you guys are the problem. I said, what? You got, you know, we're the problem. You're crazy. And he showed me the data. The vast majority of the rest of young people were not at 5 in the afternoon or at 2 in the morning. It was during the school day. It was 9 to 3. So our schools were calling the police to arrest kids coming out of school. So it was a really brutal wake-up call to me and my team. And so we dug into the data. And uh, we found, it's staggering, we found that 7% of our schools, 7%, were producing 53% of the arrests. And so we had schools three or four blocks from each other, all the same challenges, with no arrests, none in a year, and another school down a block with two or three kids being arrested every single day. I mean, staggering numbers. So we had to you know, be very self-critical and look in the mirror. We shared the data, did a ton of principal training, training with teachers in those schools, had the higher performing schools talk about what they were doing in terms of discipline, poli you know, discipline uh, policies and peer juries and other things, restorative justice, and we were able to drive that down pretty significantly. So it's the kind of thing I always say, that we, you know, we have to sort of face these brutal truths. And I was pleased that we were able to figure that out and start to correct it, but I'm still sick. That was like in my fifth or sixth year, 
and during those early years, we were really a huge, huge part of that challenge. And so I think the, these take very tough conversations. It takes looking in the mirror and challenging oneself. But in far too many places, that's the norm. Um, again, for all the challenges, we didn't have to go someplace else to find solutions. We had solutions in our toughest neighborhoods. We had to take to scale what was working. We had to lift up those principals who got it and have them help train all of us. And uh, that was what, how we were able to improve it. But that was a very, very tough lesson that we had to learn. Thank you. Good afternoon, Lynette Tannis. I'm an advanced doctoral student here in the Urban Superintendents Program. My research interests actually are uh, focused on the incarcerated youth. And as you know, nationally, 75% of our children who are incarcerated are, have dropped out of school. Um, I guess based on my research, knowing that there are some pockets of excellence as we have in our traditional schools and our charter schools, my question is, how much are we engaging our juvenile justice educators? in the same types of conversations to ensure that our children who are incarcerated, as you mentioned, disproportionately children of color, disproportionately children uh, of poverty and children with special needs, um, to ensure that while they are incarcerated, the opportunity gap does not continue yeah, to persist. Yeah. It, it's a great question. The huge challenge is actually we ran two schools that were in, in jails in Chicago. We had young kids as you know, 10, 11, 12 being locked up, which was crazy, but we had to provide them an education. And I'll tell you, some of the most inspiring educators were folks who had dedicated their lives to working with those young people. And there are huge challenges. There are technology challenges where they don't allow access to computers and the internet. Um, you have also, obviously, huge transition challenges. Some you know, young people in there for two weeks, some for two years, some for 20. Um, so it's very, very difficult. But you have some amazing educators who are in those tough situations every single day working very, very hard and making a real difference. So we have to continue to listen to them. We have to continue to learn and share what's working. But I have to tell you, a huge part of my focus is preventing more young people from getting locked up. I think it is so tough on the back end. You have people doing Herculean work in very difficult circumstances. We're trying to figure out how do we, again, not just keep expelling, not keep suspending the young boys of color, not keep labeling special education, get them the supports and opportunities when they're young. We haven't talked today. We definitely need a lot more men and men of color to come into education, particularly in the elementary grades. We can't walk away from the arts and dance and drama and music and sports to engage students in very different ways. When budgets get cut, those things go away. People lose interest in schools. They, stop to, they start to disengage. They end up getting locked up. So no simple answer here. I think the voice of those great educators is critical. But for me, the big thing is how do we stop this pipeline? How do we stop the flow? Thank you. Hello. My name is Ayana Key. And I'm also an advanced doctoral student here at the School of Education. And it's been so exciting to hear you today. Um, I recently completed a study of over 1,600 first-year teachers. And a lot of my results supported um, residency programs. Yeah. And I also um, had sort of a surprising finding that teachers who did receive those foundational courses like learning theory and psychology courses did report feeling better prepared in this sample of teachers. And I think kind of the difference may be that some teachers are receiving high quality um, foundational education classes and others aren't. And I was wondering how you see the federal government partnering with schools and colleges of education um, to improve teacher knowledge and student achievement. Well, let me just give you one example, and we're trying to, to move in this direction. So the state of Louisiana looks at all the different, whether it's schools of education or alternative pathways, troops of teachers or Teach for America, looks at how the alumni of these feeder programs, how they're doing the classroom, looks at the results of their students and traces that back. So it's not about got you, it's about continuous improvement. And so you have hundreds of thousands of student records, tens of thousands of teacher records, and they're starting to change curriculum. It's not just, again, across a school, but it might be this school's math work, math program, or this school's ELL program. They're finding strengths and weaknesses. What's so interesting to me, and I always talk about this, is Louisiana doesn't have some patent on technology. Uh, this is not something that other states couldn't replicate, but they're about the only state. There are two or three others that are moving this direction. But it's not about gotcha, it's just about continuous improvement. So I think the best thing we can do when we're trying to move in this direction is encourage other states to look at all their different feeder programs, again, traditional, non-traditional, alternative certification, whatever it is, look at the results of their alumni students, see who's doing a good job, see who's not, and then correct things you know, back where it came from. When this happened in Louisiana, a set of uh, schools of education, a set of deans embraced this, and a set of deans retired immediately. And that was okay. There was going to be a lot of change, and they weren't quite up for it. That's okay. Let's have that conversation. 
but I think that's the kind of model where we don't have the answers, you're not going to have all the answers, but just feedback year after year will start to tell us which schools of education are doing well in what areas and where they need to improve. That's the kind of feedback we need. It makes no sense to me that we have one state out of 50 with that plan fully in place. Hi, my name is Halliday Douglas and I'm with the EPM program uh, here. And uh, my question had to do more with the, the concept of adoption versus adaption. It's, uh, we're studying this over in a management class I have with a guy by the name of Bob Bain. And his, the, the distinction he's trying to make is that while, you, while great um, organizations adapt um, what works for other organizations. And I'm, I'm trying to find this balance between a bureaucracy uh, that is trying to systemize everything and has a responsibility to, to at least have standards. And so I'm, on the one hand, I'm looking at that. And on the other hand, I'm looking at this idea of autonomy and the need for schools to adapt to their very, very specific environments. Yeah, yeah. And just trying to get your comments on or feedback on What's the balance? Hopefully I answered the question correctly. I'm not quite sure on adapt versus adopt, but I think I, I, think I got it. But let me, I think the trade-off that I always see is sort of how do you manage? How do you manage states? How do you manage districts? How do you manage schools? My sort of philosophy on this, on management, is the opposite of No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind was very, very loose on goals. So 50 different standards, 50 different goal posts, many of which got dummied down, but very prescriptive on how you got there. I want to go the opposite way. I want to be very, very tight, high bar, college and career standards for everybody, internationally benchmarked. And again, that leadership's come from the states, but then give a lot of flexibility, a lot of autonomy in terms of how you get there and what you need to do in inner city Boston versus in Alaska <laughs> versus on a Native American reservation. The strategies to hit that high bar are going to be very, very different. You've got to give folks room to be creative at the local level. But I think you have to hold folks accountable to a high bar. So that's the fundamental trade-off we're trying to make give people a lot more room to move. That's why we're doing this waiver package. But again, hold people accountable to a high bar. So in my mind, it's tight on goals, being absolutely clear about goals, but give folks a lot more room to move to hit them, loose on means. And you'd apply this flexibility to uh, neighborhood level, not just local. States, schools. districts, neighborhoods, schools. If you're a principal, you want to have great, great teachers. You want to empower them. You want to hold them accountable to a high bar, but I don't think you want to micromanage 50 or 70 or 100 teachers in there. Have them hit that high bar, but give them a lot of room to move. I think great talent is attracted to that kind of challenge and attracted to that kind of autonomy. When it's top down, you know, one way, my way, the highway, I think great talent flees. That's not a way you're going to keep them. You're going to keep, you're going to keep folks who like compliance. That's not what we need in education. Thank you. All right, wow. Let me do, uh, and I got to get one or two from Twitter. Let me do uh, one here, one here, then I'll cut it off, and one from Twitter. So I'm sorry. Um, one here, one here, and then Matt. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, yeah. My name is Daniel Velasquez. I'm a policy and management uh, master's student here as well. And I was a bilingual kindergarten teacher as a full disclosure. So my question is around bilingual education with a rapidly growing Hispanic yeah. population and so many countries uh, yeah. putting out you know, very competitive bilingual students. What do you think is the role of the federal government in supporting that kind of initiative? So two different things. First of all, just the idea of our children growing up bi or trilingual is something we desperately need to encourage. Um, I worry about our students being at a competitive disadvantage when they don't have those, ki those kinds of opportunities. One of the things I, when I was in Chicago I was most proud of is we had the largest Mandarin program in the country. And many of my students learning Mandarin were Hispanic. So these were first generation who were going to grow up trilingual and sort of think about the opportunity structure they had relative to others. But I think your larger question is uh, we have a, uh, everywhere a uh, rapidly expanding Hispanic population. It's actually now the largest in public education. And our ability to thrive as a country is not just good for the Hispanic community. Our, the Hispanic community's strength and vitality and educational accomplishment is inextricably linked to what our nation is going to do. So continuing to support great bilingual education, recruiting more teachers, I appreciate uh, more men on the early, ch early childhood side is hugely important. And this is off topic, but I think as a country, we just got to get our act together in the DREAM Act. I just think we're absolutely crazy. We have so many young students of talent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
they, they, they work hard, they play by all the rules, they get good grades, they're community leaders, and then we, sh we slam shut the door of opportunity. So again, not one answer, but continue to invest, continue to have more students grow up buying trilingual, and to make sure all students, regardless of where they're born, regardless of what they pay for, they have a chance to go into some form of higher education. Thank you. I did my doctorate here. My name is Randy Testa, and I now work for one of the studios that produced um, Waiting for Superman. And I guess my question in light of your comments today, is there a next movie you feel um, we in Hollywood should be making? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. Uh, again, people can like or not like Waiting for Superman. I just love the debate. I love the fact that folks are engaged. I think our biggest battle, frankly, is not around ideology, it's around complacency. And um, we have far too many people who think education is sort of good enough now. And I have a huge sense of urgency. Um, it's not a great answer to your question. I'm not good in the, in the movie business. I'll tell you one story that I think hasn't been told and it would be fascinating. All the press, all the publicity has been around Race to the Top, which was $4 billion for the entire country. We also put $4 billion into the bottom 5% of schools, these school improvement grants. It's a massively disproportionate investment. And again, for decades, we have just let these bad schools languish and done, done nothing. We now have 1,000 schools that are fighting this really tough battle to be turned around. I was in a wonderful turnaround school today, John F. Kennedy Elementary School, that again, in the past year or two, are seeing double-digit gains. Nothing easy about this, hell of a long way to go, but they're going the right way. But I think looking at these students, looking at their families, um, looking at these amazing teachers and principals that are doing this hard work, I think that's an amazingly compelling story that the public's generally miss. It is tough, it is hard, it is controversial. Not to go on too long, but last question, just tell you one quick story. Um, one of the high schools I turned around Chicago was Englewood High School in the heart of the African American community on the south side. And it was very controversial, got a huge amount of pushback uh, when we, we decided to shut it down and then open three smaller schools in it going forward. At the time, they had about a 60% dropout rate. I think 4% of students were reading at grade level. Put in these three small schools. One of the schools ended up being a small all-boys charter school that is now graduating 100% of its young men every single year. They're going on to college. When I did this, I got a call from a friend of mine, who some of you may know, a guy named Don Stewart, who was the former president of the college board, former president of Spelman College, who was in the Chicago Community Trust. He said, Arnie, you're not going to believe this, but 50 years ago, I was supposed to go to Englewood High School, and my mother wouldn't let me go because it was a bad school. That was 50 years ago. So he went to a different school, and then he's been this you know, educational leader around the country. My question is, what happened over those previous, those interceding 50 years? Think of all the Don Stewart's we lost because we just let that school languish. So I think that's a story. These school turnarounds, again, the good, the bad, the ugly, the difficulty, I think that's a story that folks are missing. Thank you. Matt, you get the last word. Okay, Secretary Duncan, thank you. Uh, we've been live streaming this and live tweeting this across the world today. And this is a question from someone who couldn't be here. Do you see a role for digital media and social media in helping the school uh, reform efforts? Uh, absolutely. And I think uh, so often education is such a laggard in transformation. I think the whole area of technology is a huge example of that. I always say that technology has transformed how all of you guys interact socially. It's transformed how everyone, has done, how everyone does business. It's led literally to democratic revolutions around the globe. Technology has changed education about 2% on about 2 or 3%. And when we talk about the importance of great teachers and what they do, a great teacher in a day might see 80, 100, 120, 140 uh, young people. You look at just one example, something like Khan Academy, where one teacher has reached over 190 million people providing lessons for free, absolutely for free. Um, we have to, a couple years from now, sort of complete this, tran this transition. We have to move from print to digital as fast as we can. South Korea is committed to do this by 2015. We're going to be a leader or we're going to lag them. Uh, Uruguay, not known as an education powerhouse, every single child in Uruguay has a laptop. And you have some districts that are moving this way, but again, education for a whole host of reasons has been far too slow. When you talk about uh, achievement gaps, when you talk about lack of opportunity, having students in inner city Boston, in Alaska, and a Native American reservation, having them have access to great content 24-7 is a big, big deal, and we have to get there. Thank you so much for the thoughtful questions. Thank you for your time.
one last thing, speaking of technology, I'm trying to catch up to speed, and I know we didn't get to every question, but in about a half hour, I'll be driving to the airport. I have about a half hour in the car. If you have questions, you can ask me via Twitter at AskArnie, hashtag. So hit me some questions, and I'll try and finish up the ones I didn't get to. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah.